Welcome to the Paperless Productivity Podcast, where we have experts give you the insights, know-how, and resources to help you transform your workplace from paper to digital while making your work life better at the same time. Thanks for joining us. My name is Vince Hansen, and I'll be your host today. Our podcast will be a little bit different. Recently, ImageSoft hosted a webinar panel with three judges from across the country to discuss their experiences in the virtual court during COVID-19, and we wanted to bring a slightly edited recording of this to you. Our judges panel are from jurisdictions in Florida, Michigan, and Texas, and all are dealing with the same challenges relating to the pandemic. How their courts are operating, handling cases, and responding provides a fascinating perspective on those involved on the front lines of the justice system. We're going to cover a wide variety of topics, so let's jump right in and introduce our partner, Ben Martin from Mentis Technology, the creators of the amazing eBench solution called AI SmartBench. So at this time, I'm going to turn the video over to our co-host from Mentis Technology. Uh, Mentis are the creators of AI SmartBench. Ladies and gentlemen, Ben Martin, Vice President of Sales and Marketing. Uh, thanks, Ben. We uh, we welcome and, uh, and and thanks for being here. Uh, it's great to be here. I think we're all in for a treat uh, with our panelists today. Uh, it's my pleasure to co uh, to co moderate the this uh, occasion. And um, so, uh, as you know, COVID nineteen has changed courts forever. We were just chatting before we got on how many of the courts are experiencing outbreaks of COVID right now and the amount of quarantine that's going on in the respective courts. And so that's really very timely for us to uh, dive into uh, the virtual court. I think we're uh, finding that it's a consensus uh, around the states that the virtual court is here to stay. So what does the virtual court need to be virtual ready? And um, I would say that a connected court is more than just an online Zoom meeting. It's more than camera enabled PCs at home with a good network uh, connection. Certainly you need those are some equivalents uh, uh, to Zoom, uh, but a, a connected court means being connected to the case calendar remotely that aggregates and manages both in-person and virtual hearings and launches directly to the case. Uh, the case docket, one easy access to every official document in the case, along with associated documents, notes, and cases. Want to be connected to the attorneys and case participants, a web-enabled way for the, uh, to communicate what's available and when cases are being heard, as well as bringing them into the courtroom. Uh, connected to signing cues, so an easy way for attorneys uh, to send and for judges to receive generated from uh, the court to be able to review, update, and e-sign orders from both. And finally, uh, vital sources from the justice community, links out to the DMV, the jail, probation. All of these are key components to a virtual court. If we look at the future of the virtual court, and that's really one of the, the core topics today is what are we looking at? I think we, in, the, in the past, we were looking at a paperless courtroom as, saving the, as a way to save money for the county and for the clerk. But now the virtual courtroom goes beyond saving money. Uh, it uh, ensures continuity of service in times of crisis, such as the one we're in now. It's able to reach the hard to reach indigent population. We'll be talking more about that. It supports a quarantining judge or quarantining case participants who are have to be at home for 14 days, even if they aren't the one that is sick. And so in order for the court to keep moving forward, they have to have a mechanism to be able to connect those judges and those participants in. Uh, the hybrid approach can provide new efficiencies for certain case types, and we'll be talking about that. And certainly it optimizes the preparation process so that judges can go in in advance and look at what their docket is 
be able to uh, scan through their documents and know what's coming up. So this session gives us a chance to hear insight from three seasoned judges, but these guys have uh, really mastered the virtual court. I think they have a lot to share with us. And so we're gonna be looking at what their takeaways are from the COVID-19 crisis, what tools they need to be most efficient and how they're preparing for it. So we're fortunate to have these three distinguished judges who represent three different geographies, Florida, Texas, and Michigan, and three different uh, divisions of the court, county criminal, family and civil and probate with varying levels of experience of AI SmartBench, the uh, leader in uh, eBench and uh, judicial dashboard. Uh, we have from one as a early uh, Judge Singer of the earliest adopter uh, to one of our most recent adopters, Judge Jackanette, and then Judge Meacham in the middle. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you um, each one, the uh, Honorable Judge Singer, who's with the 12th Judicial Circuit out of Manatee County, uh, been on the bench with uh, for 14 years. Uh, the Honorable Judge Meacham, uh, the 201st District Court of Travis County, and then uh, Judge Jackanette, uh, who's um, 10 years of judicial service out of Calhoun County, Michigan. And uh, we're gonna have three starter questions that I'm gonna toss to our panelists. We'll start off with our first bullet here and then uh, move it along with their others. But we wanna focus on uh, for the first round of our conversation of our BC and ACC uh, time before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. What are your, uh, what has changed for the courts in general and for your court in particular? And I'm going to toss that first to Judge Jackanet and have him lead off our discussion. All right, well, thank you. And uh, thanks for everyone for being here today. Uh, this was, this question, really in some ways is the easiest question uh, because we've all lived it. Uh, we, we all uh, were doing things pre-March 2020 in a certain traditional way. And then since then, everything has kind of turned on its head. So in that way, when I talk about this, uh, we're gonna have very similar experiences. It's one of the hardest questions though, when you think about what's to come and how we're gonna deal with some of these issues that I still haven't been able to uh, really come up with good answers here locally. And, and I know that other judges around the, the state and around the country have, have struggled too with some due process due, uh, process issues that we're facing. But I'm the chief judge here in Calhoun County, which is uh, uh, located in Battle Creek, Michigan. And so Michigan was one of the states that I think that early on was, was hardest hit uh, by the pandemic in March. And pre-March, of course, we were all kind of doing the the uh, traditional uh, court uh, attendance with uh, with attorneys and clients and witnesses, jurors, uh, as we always have. There's very little at the time, very little use of remote appearance, with the exception that in probate we did have at our uh, local hospitals uh, for people who were there for mental health reasons. We had our those hearings were done remotely, but just about everything else was done in person. And then as the pandemic hit in March uh, and we were involved administratively and how we were dealing with that with our court docket, it the very frustrating and surreal feeling was the goalposts changed virtually every day and yeah. thinking what we were going to do. Uh, maybe we would just kind of scale back on, on the types of hearings that we would hold. Maybe we would, we would scale back on, uh, what, on having jury trials. And very quickly, it turned into a shutdown. Um, and then the struggle was dealing with um, what type of emergent cases do we have that are gonna come in in any event, and maybe more so in a pandemic, uh, emergency guardianship petitions, more mental health petitions, obviously arraignments uh, uh, in criminal cases. These are things that have to happen in any event uh, on a daily basis. And dealing with that on the fly, we were uh, early on struggling with how do we do this? And, and I give credit to our state court administrator's office here in Michigan for really outfitting all of the courts in the state with licenses for 
the uh, Zoom, uh, the remote participation, uh, so that we could get up to speed on conducting our hearings. We had a slew of, of trainings on how to do those hearings. Um, and slowly we've kind of grown into this uh, type of case that we now run uh, where the judges are appearing uh, either in court uh, or from home if need be and virtually everyone else is appearing virtually everyone's appearing remotely um, and there have been discussions about what do we do with some of the the things that we know we need to do for due process uh, reasons sooner rather than later but safely and things like uh, the the hard questions that i don't have good answers for is how do we conduct a jury trial in the post-pandemic world um, how do we bring in uh, a panel of jurors on a capital case and and have sufficient spacing to conduct a jury selection let alone a jury trial and uh, we've had the idea of doing virtual uh, jury selections remotely. We've, we've talked about doing it in auditoriums. One, one of our judges mentioned doing a, a tent in our parking lot, uh, different rooms that could be used and kind of stagger how we have the jurors come in with remote capabilities so the people in the other rooms can see what's going on. All these different things are, are things that have been talked about. Uh, and while we're up to speed with just about every type of hearing that, that we are able to conduct uh, criminal docket, uh, preliminary examinations, and and jury trials really are lagging behind. Jury trials are non-existent, quite frankly. Um, that's the most significant change. If you uh, were to say how much uh, your workload or your caseload that you were um, dealing with before COVID, are you dealing with um, 100%, 80% of what you were doing before? What would you say that? Well, the, I'm in the, the Probate Judges Association here uh, in our state, and we had our, our annual meeting remotely a couple of weeks ago, and the Chief Justice for our Supreme Court was there, and she mentioned that statewide, the probate bench uh, has been able to do about 65% of their hearings. Uh -huh. uh, the circuit bench is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 55%. I might be wrong about that. And she said the district bench is at 30 percent and when you think about it that makes sense to me with the types of hearings the the guardianships and conservatorships mm -hmm. mental health hearings in the probate court we've been able to do uh, the circuit bench much of that is is uh, criminal trial based but not all of it so there's also the family division which is able to be have their caseload uh, in in large part that's been able to continue but the district court is really impacted greatly because you have um, landlord tenant cases, which in our state were, were just stopped entirely yep. until yesterday actually. And, uh, and then you have the preliminary examinations and uh, civil and misdemeanor jury trials. All of those are in this giant uh, holding pattern right now, which yep. we're, we're struggling with. Yeah, Judge Meacham, uh, what percentage would you say you guys are operating at now. I know it's been kind of a graduated process for you guys, right? Yes, I think just like Judge Jackanat was saying, it's been a moving process where at first we thought we were just shutting down for a couple of weeks. Um, and we then have had to sort of reconcile with this is going to be an online court for a much longer period of time. Um, right. So while at first, you know, we weren't really doing much at all because we had not, just like he was saying, the technology was new. Um, we had done some Skype witnesses, but I had never heard of Zoom until March. Yeah. Um, like Michigan, uh, Texas yeah. did the same thing and they got everybody licenses for Zoom and, and actually licenses for YouTube, for stations on YouTube too, to broadcast what you were doing to meet the open courts provision of the Texas right. Constitution. Um, but so at first we were still moving slowly. And I think at first we started at maybe getting 10%. We were just handling the emergencies. I'm the civil presiding judge here for all civil cases and all family cases. And we quickly learned that the family cases weren't going to stop. And in fact, they were going to keep coming at the same capacity level. And yeah. we were going to need to meet that. Um, and so we had to get up to speed quickly. I would say in March, you know, we were maybe 15%. In April, we did a little better, uh, 25, 30%. 
Um, by May, we were, I think, probably at 50%. And I think now, I think we're doing 80% of our dockets Are you? successfully. Yeah. Like Judge Jacquinette said, we, we haven't really crossed the jury trial Rubicon yet. They've been shut down by Texas Supreme Court here uh, through September 1st. So no one can really do that until September 1st anyway. So that's the ongoing issue. Lots of discussions yeah. being had about that. But in terms of online court, all remote, all by Zoom, um, evidentiary hearings, as well as motions and other types of hearings, I think we're probably at about 80%. And what's not there is a lot of that is just, I think, lawyer reluctance to engage as well. Some lawyers right. want to wait it out strategically. They don't want to be online. They'd rather wait until this ends and they think for now their case can wait. I think that's changed too with lawyers uh, mm -hmm. where their mind was in March isn't where their minds are in July as they see this go on. And, and you look like um, right now you're going to continue to do virtual court till January at least. Is that right? I mean right now Austin, Texas, we are one of the um, hot spots I think. Right. Uh, the whole state of Texas and in our urban counties here uh, do not look great. And so we're we're taking a lot of options. I mean, I don't know that we've made the full decision that we're not I doing see. it until January. I think right. we are we're adjusting to the new normal. And we're yeah. trying to be flexible and open and adapting. Um, and innovative and just trying to make it work because yeah. all that's really needed in this time of a pandemic and we weren't really prepared for it but I think the technology part we're catching up and we're being as agile as we can be to meet the demand of the public and the demand of lawyers uh, yeah. it's hard it's not ideal but we're making it work yeah how about you judge singer what's the story there in manatee well, let's talk about um, the positive takeaways and the negatives. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Manatee County is very much like uh, Judge Meacham's uh, experiences in Texas. Uh, as um, most of you, I'm sure, know, Florida is uh, really high in the red zone right now. We yeah. have uh, several judges who are out uh, in quarantine because of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, we have a Courthouse in DeSoto County, which is our smallest of three counties, which closed yesterday for uh, sanitation because one of the clerks uh, tested positive. So we have a lot of issues to deal with. And just like Judge Meacham and Judge Jackinette indicated, it's a moving target. Things change sometimes even on a daily basis. But what are some of the real positives that we've seen? Well, in Manatee County courts, uh, we have uh, a very active small claims and uh, pro se practice, both in civil as well as family. And uh, we're seeing a much higher percentage of participation by mm -hmm. litigants, both the plaintiffs mm -hmm. and the defendants, yeah. uh, who are able to access the court system through Zoom, which they were not able to do before, because prior to the COVID uh, starting, uh, we didn't have uh, administrative uh, rules issued by the Florida Supreme Court that made it very easy to have uh, a Zoom type courtroom. Uh, all those rules were suspended. Uh, the party cannot object to Zoom right now, and hopefully that will remain after the COVID virus is gone, because we find that uh, people uh, enjoy, if you can say enjoyment in going to court is, is something that people feel uh, that they bring to the table, but uh, people are participating. Uh, on all sides. A lot of times we were seeing defaults, defendants in civil cases simply would not come. Uh, that's changing. And uh, it's not often when I run a regular courtroom that I would have everyone show up. I'm finding 95% participation in our civil cases uh, with the litigants all appearing by Zoom. Of course, uh, we have some interesting problems with that, what the background looks like, dogs mm -hmm. barking and the other things but a little bit of instruction and we're able to, to move forward. So the real positive is that the technology is bringing people into the courtroom through um, 
um, remote viewing, uh, which hopefully after all this is over, uh, we will continue to be able to allow people without too much obstruction to be able to attend their proceedings uh, through Zoom. Uh, yeah. Of course, the, the downside is the same as Judge Jackanet was talking about. Uh, justice is very hard to accomplish uh, when you're not open for business and you can't have jury trials. And so uh, on that end, uh, we're, we're pretty much in a stall for our criminal cases. Mm -hmm. uh, once we get past the arraignment process, uh, the cases are set on for our pretrial conferences. And right now uh, we uh, went from simply just in bulk continuing cases in May and April uh, to future court dates to actually running our pretrial conferences through Zoom and having all the attorneys attend by Zoom. And that's quite a bit. Uh, a typical uh, hearing for a pretrial conference in county court right now, we're running about 300 cases that have to be done in about three hours, and it takes a, a little bit of learning. On the bright side, the, the positive takeaway is that a lot of the judges who were kind of tentative with all of their technology uh, have had to embrace it, and they've yeah. learned it. Yeah. And uh, what we're going to find is after all this is over, that in those places, uh, even within uh, one circuit, where we had many judges who really needed someone to run their computer for them in order that they could access SmartBench or whatever court yeah. viewer is being used, uh, the judges have learned how to do it. They're learning how to sign documents electronically. So there Whether are a lot of pluses. <laughs> yeah. Um, on the other hand, as Judge Jackinette said, our evictions have stalled, our mm. jury trials have stalled, and uh, once uh, we get into phase three and phase four and get closer back to normal, we're going to have a flood. And yeah. we're, we're planning to be ready for that. Yeah. Well, that we might judge, piggyback on what you just said and jump to our third question and pitch this to Judge Meacham and thinking about uh, access to justice, pros and cons of the virtual court. Uh, judge Singer was talking about uh, greater participation, greater access. Do you want to talk to that for out, out of the family? No. Kind of Sure, I will. So um, access to justice in Travis County, we have a long history, I think, of being on the forefront of that um, long before I got here and being really involved in those discussions statewide, but also in the nation. And so that's been a big concern for us, I think, all through this process. We knew that lawyers would have access to the technology. We knew that we could get access to the technology. Like everybody's been saying, there's resistance to the technology. But that's just because technology isn't, I don't love having to learn about two or three new apps a day. Like that is right. not how I like spending my time. But we've been having to do that. And, and once you kind of start doing it and you're agile with it, it, it gets easier and easier. Um, but we were worried about pro se litigants, um, yeah. self-represented litigants, still are, by the way. Um, but what we learned in family court cases, especially shorter cases, was that just so many people in the community do have a cell phone and yeah. have a smartphone. And what we started learning is a short hearing in a family law case with two people who don't have lawyers, um, but who need to have an issue decided almost on an emergency basis, that probably is more accessible to them than finding childcare, finding parking, uh, finding yeah. transportation, all of yeah. those things that are challenging to get sometimes to the courthouse. And so that's been an interesting observation. It certainly wasn't where I started in all of this because we've been yeah. so hyper concerned about all of it. And there are still worries and still concerns now that our central dockets have opened back up. Um, and we don't always know until a couple of days ahead of time which court's going to get a particular case. Reaching those self represented litigants is particularly tricky. Uh, mm -hmm. It involves a lot of communication by court staff on the front end and making sure they have access. We have set up Zoom rooms, we're calling them, for lack of a better word, in yeah. the courthouse that can, if people can only get to, if they don't have access another way, they can get to the courthouse and they will have access to a computer, to a camera, to where they can participate in the hearing. I see, yeah. Um, the big thing is with jury trials, and I will I just add to that a little bit, is we are going to pilot. We have no preconceived notions. We aren't 
we're trying to find willing participants here in Travis County, willing lawyers to do a pilot uh, jury trial by Zoom in August. Mm -hmm. We have approval from the Office of Court Administration to do that. And one of the big challenges with that from an access to justice perspective is making sure that the veneer panel, um, that you're not leading people out who don't have access to a computer or access to Wi-Fi. Um, and what we're doing in the pilot is the Office of Court Administration is actually, they have some tablets that they're gonna make sure that the veneer panel that's called, if somebody says they don't have access, they're gonna get those. I, we'll see, right? I'm, I'm right. skeptical, but also open. I think that's how we're all having to be in this time, having to be willing to right. learn, but also be concerned about the Constitution, the Seventh Amendment, due process, access to justice, but also be open that we have a 21st century problem and maybe we can solve some of it with 21st century solutions. Yeah. Um, it seems like you were, were mentioning in another prior conversation that uh, the the zoom view into the home oftentimes gives you some uh surprising inputs into the dynamics that you're addressing that doesn't come up in the courtroom everybody's kind of got their best face on in their best suit and uh, you might um, have a different view when you're uh, zooming with somebody on their phone Is that, uh, definitely right? true you can yeah. get you can get the background noise of childcare or people yelling or um, yeah. lots of things. You can see that my I'm from home because we're mostly home now. You can see my office is a lot uh, messier than the judges who I think are <laughs> in their chambers. Yeah, uh, that that just in it alone tells you something when you get that insight into people's homes. Well, yeah. that that's not entirely true because I'm I'm blocking uh, a big section <laughs> that that really is messy. So. <laughs> We're messy at the office too. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, and then talk, one thing I, I would, talk, would mention yeah, yeah. is that while we do sometimes have a problem with a person being too casual on Zoom, as opposed to when they walk into the courtroom and they're kind of um, uh, put back uh, because they're in an unfamiliar place, and yeah. so they tend to be more polite and to behave right. themselves in an appropriate manner. You lose that on Zoom, but it just takes a little bit of time and, and thought process for the judge in a very patient way to remind the people who are on Zoom that we're not in your car with you having a discussion. We're yeah, actually yeah. in a courtroom. We need yeah. you to be patient. We need yeah. you to be quiet. Wait for the questions to be asked. On the other hand, we also have a fantastic ability with Zoom and other products to have breakout rooms so that when I've got a civil case, which is say a credit card debt collection case, and the parties haven't had a chance to talk, well, I'll move them into a private room where the two of them can have an unmonitored conversation. And then when right. they're ready, they can uh, raise their hand and I can either join in the break room or they can come back out into the main Zoom room, which yeah. actually is a lot more efficient than asking them all to just simply step out of the courtroom uh, or have me step out of the courtroom while they're using the courtroom to negotiate their case. Interesting. Yeah. Well, maybe we can shift just uh, uh, a little bit into um, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the Zoom tool and what it's enabling in terms of connecting you and having these side rooms. Maybe we can talk a little bit about other tools and processes that have brought you the most value uh, in conducting the virtual court. And maybe Judge Singer, you could lead us off there. Well, the first thing is we've been using SmartBench for quite some time. Uh, as soon as uh, we started to empty the courthouse with the judges uh, and um, the judges started working from home, SmartBench became a, an extremely valuable tool. All the judges lined up in order to get um, a, um, uh, this is current user, which is me. This is for next Tuesday, the 21st. Uh, we have a civil hearing in the morning, and then I have a very lengthy uh, criminal docket. And you can review this at home. And for those judges that do primarily civil work, uh, this whole agenda view would be made up of civil cases that you can sit at home uh, the night before or the morning before the hearing start. You can open up any one of the cases uh, like I'm doing here, and the case comes up. You've got 
all the documents that have been filed in the case, uh, see what the uh, motion is. And here we have for next week uh, a motion setting the defendant's uh, request to dismiss or to determine rent in a uh, eviction case. Uh, so the first tool is having the smart bench because that allows you access to your uh, at your agenda, not only for one day, but for the whole week. You can map out your strategies for what you're going to do. Uh, we're doing a lot of coverage right now. So if I was going to cover for Judge Sniffen for next week, I could bring up his calendar for Monday and there's his hearing. And so as long as I know what I'm supposed to do, I can have access uh, through all that. Um, we have a calendar view, which allows you to bring up uh, your calendar or all the calendars to see what's on the, uh, the schedule. So the first part of the preparation is in fact to be able to sit down with your computer, go through your cases uh, and to prepare them. When you're actually having a hearing and especially if it's a criminal case, and let's just go back to me, one of the things that's extremely valuable uh, when you're on Zoom uh, or if it's a civil case is to be able to pick a case and then to quickly, while people are talking, search out a name and bring up whether or not there's any other criminal cases or any other civil cases that are pending. And especially, uh, I'm sure Judge Meachin will join in on this, that if you've got a uh, injunction case or a domestic relations case for a divorce, you want to know what else is out there that's right. pending. If you're over here in county court and you're in traffic division and they come up and there's a question of paying money or they, they want to get their license back, you can see we've got three cases here that are in collections. You can take the time to go ahead and pull them out of collections and have the clerk prepare an order for you, which will set aside their license suspension, give them a chance to get their license. And then when they come back, they'll be on a payment plan for all the money that they owe. In many cases, the state will adjust the charges and adjust what they're seeking by way of penalty to essentially give a um, incentive for people to get their license back and the, to be licensed. So we're able to use SmartBench to quickly um, look at what our cases are, prepare for our cases, when we're in court or on Zoom, you can uh, see your cases. If someone says, well, you know, this is the third time that this person's been evicted from a certain place, you can check their name out real quick, see what other eviction cases there might have been, see what happened. Uh, and that's very, very helpful. Cool. Uh, Judge Meacham, I think you mentioned um, how SmartBench allowed you to um, Oh, that the attorneys aren't just driving the, um, excuse me, aren't, aren't just driving uh, what you see, that you that they've tried to maybe downplay something or not reveal it to you and you have it right there at your fingertips. I don't know, tell me what. Well, definitely, <laughs> I, will, I will say, Judge Singer helped me with SmartBench when I first got it on the product many years ago, but. I'm, I'm much more agile with it now than I used to be, and I can use it um, and do a lot of that judicial notice work that you can do where you can see things in the file um, right. quickly. Uh, when you get used to using it, you can find things quickly. All of us, you know, it's interesting. I've gone from almost never working at home to never leaving the house. <laughs> but one of the reasons that has worked is, um, is I do have access to my docket so quickly. And I can do everything really that I did um, about the case and seeing the case and seeing it on the screen at home the same way I did at work. I don't know that that's where I'm going to be when this is over. I think I want to see people again. I like going to work and having that work-life separation. But it right. has been interesting to be able to do that so quickly and to be able to sign orders from home. All of my staff has access to it too. It has raised security issues. You know, we're getting a lot of phishing attempts at the county level, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, we're having to be hyper vigilant about that because everybody's almost logging in from home, which yeah. is a really different situation than we were at four months ago. And so we have a lot of hyper vigilance on those issues. Um, but as for the dockets themselves 
and being able to see what we need to see or access what we need to access, um, that has worked really good and yeah. has allowed us to continue to uh, run our course effectively. Yeah. I think one of the things that's always been uh, nice with um, Smart Bench, of course, it was designed by judges, Judge Singer being one of them, uh, for judges, but um, it was also um, giving you a calendar view of your cases, but then direct access from the calendar. You didn't have to go over here in the list and then figure out whatever. And um, with the, the latest um, product uh, combination, there's uh, uh, you're able to click on the case and if it's a Zoom uh, um, session, as opposed to an in-person session, it'll launch Zoom for you, go straight to that link, and then take you into the case. So um, that, I'm, I'm thinking that's one of the been the, one of the missing pieces of the puzzle is you had to have a Zoom calendar and then a, just a docket calendar, and the two were not really synced up. And so I think that's where we need, you know, are going to see where things go next. Well, and I think that that's one of the things about the yeah. about the pandemic is it it has forced you forced all of us to to think about using these tools in a way that you hadn't thought of before. Yeah, right. Before March. So uh, maybe, and I'm not sure when when it was thought to uh, attach the Zoom feature to the to the Smart Bench. Right. Uh, but it it is something that I think sounds much more valuable now than I would have thought in February. Yeah, exactly. That's the world yeah. we're living in. Fortunately, it hasn't been their dead body, but it has been COVID-19. That's really changed the world and it's uh, it's changed the conversation. It's no longer, will I use technology or not? It's whether can I get technology that's going to adapt to me and to how I want to work and, you know, um, and 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 deal with the situation I'm in, but other that's, comments. That's, that's, yeah. that's right, Ben. And in fact, the the conversation from the, the the judges who were tentative with technology was, well, I'm not sure that I like this when they're first confronted with using it, or they're going to use it to the minimum. To now, they're saying, well, I'm working at home. How do I get documents sent to me so that I can view them and sign them and return them? So now they're becoming uh, on the other hand, much more interested in what else can they do because uh, it's very important that, that judges at home, as Amy will tell us, uh, be able not only to be able to view things and uh, to uh, handle the hearings, but then be able to generate orders and uh, get that over to the clerk without getting in the car and driving a piece of paper down to the courthouse. Yeah, great point. Any other? Yeah, I'll also say, I'll just add in Travis County, we have unique situation. Even early on, we had cases in the courthouse. And so we kind of out of necessity did this um, stay home as much as you can uh, quickly. Uh, we still continue to have cases there, even though there haven't been a lot of people there. I mean, it's basically a skeleton staff um, and still we've had cases. And so we have a hundred year old building. Um, it is not built sufficiently for a county of a million people. We are actually in the process of building us a new courthouse, but it's still a couple of years away. So we have had additional challenges on top of, I think, the usual challenges. Yeah. But we're trying to fit a million, a county of a million people in a building that was built for a county of 70,000. And so that is really unique and really tough in a pandemic. And we've, we've just basically out of necessity had to move to at home quickly. Um, the good news is, and Ben knows this, we actually have an in-house IT department and um, that has been yeah. just so fortunate for us because they have met all our demands and all of our needs um, and quickly met them. But we had to do that quickly out of necessity more than just, we all wanna stay home now. Because I think many of us want to be at work <laughs> Um, it's hard to do with three kids that are school age in the home yeah. um, and a husband whose office I have taken over. He <laughs> used to work out of the house. He's ready for all of us to leave. Yeah, um, yeah. So. I bet. Awesome. Well, and I, I think you're not the only, but a lot of old courthouses, beautiful courthouses have horrible ventilation <laughs> systems. So 
they really pose an additional hazard just because they can't move the air through, you know, so wow. Other observations about the either tools that have helped you or maybe things that you hope are on the horizon that um, that's that's not quite materialized. I don't know. Are there any things there? Well, uh, one thing that I'm not sure. Uh, I know we have. I looked at the list of the the people that signed up for the for the uh, yeah. webinar today, and they're from all over the place and all different types of. Uh, occupations and so I don't know whether those folks are people that, that utilize this technology or not. I'm I'm a newbie uh, as you pointed out on the beginning slide there. We've had we've had Smart Bench for one year. We've had other uh, platforms that we've used. But the when we first moved to this uh, file list system uh, that right. we're on now, uh, I don't call it paperless because we we still do right. have some paper here and there. Yeah. But but it's file list. Right. Uh, one of the huge advantages, huge advantage, whether you're in a pandemic or not, is the fact that I don't have to have people running around looking for files yeah. or looking for the motion that just it's it's in because it's scanned in. Once it's scanned in, it's it's there for for me. Right. Uh, and and it's one of those things where both my my probate court register and I can be looking at the same file the same document within the file at the same time yeah and i can have her on the phone or on teams or whatever talking about an issue um because it's available to us now and, and back right. in the day you'd, you'd put a, a physical sticky note on a yeah a in the file and then send it off and at some point she'd get it and look at it and then we'd talk about it uh, yeah. and that that time is really valuable right now uh, because one thing that it's, I very much agree with what uh, Judge uh, Singer and Judge Meacham have been saying about the advantages of of the Zoom and, and the increased participation that we're seeing. Overall, it's been, uh, I, I think, the pros greatly outweigh the cons. But one con uh, where time really becomes super valuable to us all is there are glitches with the technology with the remote appearance in court and so cases tend on average i think to take just a little bit longer sometimes quite a bit longer if yeah. you have the communication issues um so the time being really valuable to all of us having having those tools available that that compress that right that time that you're waiting for things or, or searching for things is huge yeah. And adding to that, I don't think this will ever, because of the evidence piece, the most difficult piece from my end is evidentiary mm -hmm. hearing. Right. And that is very hard. We're using a um, technology called Box, it's similar to Dropbox. Uh, it requires a ton of preparation by the lawyers, a ton by our court reporters. We still, uh, every jurisdiction is different on whether you still have court reporters or not. We definitely still have court reporters, and they are working incredibly hard right now on the front end of hearings to make sure they have everything they need for a lawyer to offer an exhibit, for them to be able to have those exhibits at the ready, for me to have those exhibits at the ready, and everybody to be able to do that um, because not everybody can share their screen. That, that's yeah. not something you can do on a cell phone anyway. And right. so we really had to come up with a reason. Uh, I think this is something that will continue for oral argument type situations. Right. I have one lawyer from Houston, one lawyer from Dallas. They have a summary judgment motion hearing, um, and they don't want to travel to Austin to do it. I think Zoom has become a real viable option for that, even after this. The, the evidentiary hearings, I'm not there yet, because those do require yeah. um, a lot of work on the front end. And it's not as sufficient. It's just not as good as mm -hmm. live and in person and yep. being able to do it that way. Yes, and I would agree with what Judge Meacham is saying. Um, in our uh, county court world in civil, uh, when we would just typically schedule a matter for a final hearing without any kind of case management conference because it's pro se litigants, you just wanna bring them in and uh, have them tell you what their account is and determine what the result is. Now uh, we're, requiring a case management conference in every one of them to 
to make sure that the participants uh, can participate evidentiary wise mm. in a Zoom hearing and then to have a discussion about how much evidence is there. It needs to be filed in advance. Everyone needs to have a copy of it in order to have an effective hearing. That's yeah. where there's a lot of extra work involved, certainly just as Judge Jack and I just said. Interesting. Um, one, one um, back to the, the file is a part that you were talking about, Judge Jackanet. I know judges love the fact that if an attorney says, I have another case, related case for this person, can we take care of it at the same time? In the old world, that was a 20 minute, go down in the basement, find the file, fish it, you know, stop, stop the presses and then bring them back in. And uh, with SmartBench, you just key it in, uh, boom, the, the case is there, you click on it, and you have it in front of you and you can take care of it at the same time. So uh, that's where I think technology shines and it's been a, a boon to courts for that um, quick access to short, shorten the time frame of everything that got, um, you know, was kind of already burdened in the paper process of getting those files in. In a lot of ways, uh, it's, it's even quicker than having to key it in because you just, in, Many of these are just hyperlinks that you just click on. That's and, right, exactly. And You're absolutely out. right, yeah. Uh, but it, it for me, I, I don't have quite the the staff that, uh, uh, it sounds like Judge Meacham has more staff than I do. I'm gonna- <laughs> Little judge in me there, little yeah. judge in yeah. <laughs> Well, but the, thing, the thing that I'm doing is I'm doing a lot of this uh, on the bench uh, by myself. Um, yeah. And, so to have all these tools handy where I'm I'm essentially running the show with the, the Zoom and putting it up like uh, uh, was said, we, we have to do the, the YouTube live streams of our hearings uh, in most all cases. And uh, so I'm doing all that and, and being able to, at the ready, pull up files of two, two different screens in the courtroom, uh, but to be able to pull up files quickly in the midst of all that is is really it's a change for me because i was one of the people with the uh you know the tablet and the chisel and and uh, right the over my dead body person were you uh, <laughs> it, it so just, it, i didn't see the need to change from what i've been doing for so long exactly. but uh it's yeah. uh when when you don't have many workable alternatives uh, that's a great motivator to to yeah that's true thanks thanks again for that um, we did get a couple of questions that came in during the uh, during the webinar. The, the first question that came in uh, really focused on SmartBench, actually, and they um, I think some members of the audience were curious, what features or functionality do the panel judges utilize the most with SmartBench on a daily basis? Uh, so maybe zeroing in on something that may, maybe is something that you you have to have in order to be productive and efficient now. Can, can I answer that as the, the newest person that- That'd be that great. <laughs> so I, I'm the one here out of all the panelists that that least knows how to how to use SmartBench well, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning. But uh, the thing that, that I do without fail is I'll open it up and I'll go to the calendar. And the calendar, I use it more to to forecast what I've got coming up in coming days because I like to prep ahead of time. And um, that will allow me to see what I have and easily click on the cases that appear on, on let's say Wednesday, Wednesday's docket. Uh, and then I'll just go through, when I click on that case, it will bring up the case, it'll bring, bring up the pleadings. I'll have highlighted the, the pleadings that are important to me for that case. I can, I can, uh, highlight aspects within the pleadings that are important, uh, flag those, and then move on to the next case. Uh, if I need to, um, sometimes the names will be familiar to me for some reason, and I'll click on the name, and that'll bring up, like was said, other cases that are yeah. uh, that are there. So I don't know if that's more kind of rudimentary, but I do that all the time with it. And, yeah. Uh, awesome. Judge Meacham, anything you'd add, or what's vital to you? So I don't want to add too much complexity to this because Ben knows this. We have a central docket in Travis County, which is like a presiding docket, if you've ever seen it all. Um, 11 of the district judges and our six 
associate judges, we all share the same dockets. And I, I get a lot of feedback about that from judges across the state, but it works for us and we like it. Um, and what, what y'all worked with us many years ago is making sure that we had good communication with each other on those cases. So we use something called docket entries and judges notes that um, y'all helped us set up. It works a little differently on our product, I think, than other people's, and we've had to do some right. adaptation on our end, but it's worked great. And we can see what the judges who saw this case before their observations were about the case and everything that they put into the case, uh, we can see that quickly. And yeah. um, most, some of it's private, some of it is right. public. Uh, it depends on the case and what the judge is trying to say, but that's the, probably the function we use the most. Our smart bench is set up and I'm assuming this is true for everybody, but we pull from both our case management system and our document management system. Um, and we can also find the access to the attorney's phone numbers, which helps staff a lot, especially now, attorney's phone numbers and attorney's emails, because having to do all that communication um, has been key in this, because we're not waiting for them to come to us. We're having to communicate with them, um, almost being the first point of contact is our contact now. Yep. So that quick access to their information, I think, is really key um, on our side of things. Awesome. Judge Singer, anything you'd add that in terms of? Well, the, the number one item by far is case comments. Mm -hmm. um, in a high volume court like I run, um, putting case comments in whenever you're doing something on a case uh, is vital because I can't remember one case from the next yeah. unless there's something unique about it. Right. And so I'm always going back. And when I pull up a case because I've got a letter or there's a motion for reconsideration or something, I pull up the case comments and it's right there. Whatever I did, uh, we also have a secondary docket that you handwrite notes for your assistant that let your assistant know what happened in the case. But by filling in case comments and giving your assistant uh, permission to be able to view your case comments, then it's right there in the in the file, just the way it was in the old days, where you put either a piece of paper or a sticky note on the court right. file. So case yeah. comments are number one, and then uh, really number two was just what Judge Jackin had said: having the agenda view, the calendar, being able yeah. to look at cases and to study up in advance. Uh, I've not I've been on the bench almost 15 years. I've never used paper, so right. if I didn't have smart bench, if I didn't have the computer. Uh, someone have to tell me what's going on because I, I wouldn't know. Yeah. So the, the next question was, um, what should be on the roadmap from a judicial tools to better support the virtual courtroom? And and maybe I heard a little bit about evidence, um, maybe yeah. some challenges uh, around there just with the process of prep and folks not knowing how to use those tools. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe I'm not trying to answer the question for you, but I thought I heard it during the session. Yeah. A good lead. Yeah, uh, and I don't know. I don't know that that is a fixable problem either. I'm assuming it is because what I'm learning is technology usually has fixes. But right now, it's just the lack of everybody being in the same room together. Um, the spontaneity sometimes. You'll, you're never going to fix that problem with technology, I don't think, because some things that happen spontaneously happen, um, and that's been harder in this process. But I think if, if people could figure that out with technology, how to make it possible for somebody in the moment, a good lawyer, to be able to have an idea and have a piece of evidence um, that they weren't rebuttal evidence, basically, um, that they were going to use in the moment that makes sense in the moment, that they haven't gotten us in the front end. I mean, yes, they right. can share their screen, but how do they actually get it to us for us to admit it right. as part of the official record? That is, right. that's a trick. That I don't know, and I'm maybe it's coming. Right now, it's very hard to do. We can do it, and I, I haven't used it as a reason to not have hearings. What I've told lawyers are, listen, I'm open. We're learning, and so I'm never going to say to somebody, "Oh, you can't do it because the technology isn't there yet." Um, it just takes a while to get it done. Right. Um, several emails, lots of people copied, um, admitting something after the fact, all of that. Um, yeah. If that can happen more in the moment and spontaneous, that would definitely be helpful. 
How about you, Judge Singer? What would you like to see on the Judge Judicial Tools Roadmap, the next thing that would make your life beautiful? <laughs> well, certainly if I was with our designers of Zoom, that's where I would be looking is to see how one could easily take a camera shot of whatever it is they want the judge to see and it yeah. could be easily displayed. I would be surprised if we don't see something like that in the mm. very near future. Mm. Uh, I think though that in the at the end of the day, when you're talking about evidence, when you have advocacy, when you need a jury, doing things in person is still going to be the way that it's going to go. Yeah. Uh, I think it, uh, I would find it very difficult to try to weigh credibility by looking at somebody on Zoom. Uh, the uh, other aspect of it is that I do think that attorneys have been very slow to bring their own technology into the courtroom in presenting their cases to a jury. It's been mm -hmm. surprising to me over time how little our attorneys have used Google Maps, for example, in yeah. presentations of uh, simple criminal cases. Uh, there's a lot of technology that's out there that the attorneys have been reluctant to use. It may very well be that we're most of our attorneys that are the lit litigating attorneys either are older or they're spending so much time because they've been in law school learning the law they haven't really been focused on the technology aspect of things mm -hmm. this may very well change and once we get back to the new normal as everyone likes to call it i think yeah. you'll see the attorneys much more adept at coming into the courtroom with their computers with their technology tools to make president present presentations uh, a lot more lively and interesting for the jurors uh, and for the judges and in a way that will promote their advocacy and help their cause. Uh, interesting. Anything you judge, add, Judge Jackanek? Well, one, one thing that I, I just think needs to occur for, for whatever sort of virtual hearing that you're gonna have to, for it to be effective, the connections, the connectivity between yeah. the uh, the, those remote participation platforms, yeah. Zoom or whatever it is, it has to be better, uh, more consistent. Uh, Can't lock up. It has to be something that really assists us long term. It's been a godsend short term. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with the other judges that um, it, the, the courtroom choreography of a jury trial, I, I don't think you can replicate virtually. Uh, yeah. Not a lot of it, anyways. Thanks, uh, thanks for uh, the participation of all the judges today, your time and uh, your knowledge and just comments on the section. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's been an enlightening session with our panelists to better understand a day in the life of the post-pandemic court and seeing how court jurisdictions across the country are responding to the many challenges we are now faced with. If you'd like to learn more about ImageSoft or our solutions for the justice community, please go ahead and visit our website at imagesoftinc.com. This concludes today's podcast. Thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day. Thanks again for joining us on this podcast. To learn more about ImageSoft, please visit imagesoftinc.com. That's imagesoftinc.com. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to Paperless Productivity, where we tackle some of the biggest paper-based pain points facing organizations today. We'll see you next time.